We're now at Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, <clears throat> who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, I just had to read the whole passage. It's such a great passage. It's, uh, you can just preach a whole sermon off of this chapter. All, you know what a good sermon is? All I do is just read you the Bible. That's a good sermon, bless God, alright? Just good sermon. Just read verses, alright? And you get under conviction. <laughs> now the passage obviously shows that you've learned at today's Sunday morning Bible study that Adam's sin had such a detrimental deep effect that it passed upon not just only him but his generations and throughout all time until and unless somebody comes into the scene and rescues everybody. Yes. But if this one person named Jesus did not come in to rescue them from the scene everything would have been cut off. Everything would have been lost. And that's the point that I want to make here is that that's the power of sin. Had it not been for Jesus Christ, you got to realize this, where would you be right now? Now a lot of people, they think that they can live their life away from Christianity, but think about this. If you lived life without Jesus Christ, where would you be stuck with? With the detrimental effect of Adam. Right. People think they can figure out their own problems. They can live out their own life to the fullest. Some people, they think that sin is a joke, that they can mess around with it. Some people think that it's a party. Some people scoff and laugh at sin. Some of you might think that I'm just too serious concerning about the nature of sin. And then some of you might go, what's wrong with drinking? What's wrong with dancing? What's wrong with this and what's wrong with that? And then, you know, oh, you consider it as worldly. You consider it as stuff like that. But you've got to realize that sin is deep. And sin is sin. So that's one thing that I learned about the nature of sin is that it is very deep in scope. And it is a very eye-opening thing. Once you understand the nature of sin, you start to learn more how to conquer it, how to battle it, how to not be discouraged, how to encourage yourself, how to find victory against addiction, and how to live more joyously in life. You cannot be happy unless sin is gone, period. Can I repeat that again? You cannot be happy unless sin is gone, period. Now I know that in this Bay Area, this is a distorted way of di thinking. A lot of you are new and this might be very new to you. And you might be troubled. Uh, I'm always open to uh, answer questions after church if you have any questions. I want you to understand that. So I understand that being in this Bay Area. I came from a Berkeley background. So I know their type of thinking. But that's the thing, is that sin is so powerful and deep in scope, it appears innocent. It appears as if it's invisible and it doesn't exist. That's why people now come to the point of, you know, everything is relative now. There's no such thing as sin. But you don't realize the heavy price, the high price of sin. And I hope that today's preaching will open your eyes and help you. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father God, I need the filling power of your Spirit. Help me to preach what you want me to preach and not my flesh and not my own way of thinking. <clears throat> I pray that it will be completely from the Holy Spirit. Help me not to compromise. Help me not to try to please people. Uh, but help me also uh, not to preach in a way that is done out of the flesh. 
Help it to be completely in a way that you want it to be preached. Sin is such a deadly thing, and it needs to be preached against. And the devil won't like this sermon. So I pray that you'll fill me now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, now uh, we're going to look at scriptures together. Alright, go to Galatians 6. Galatians chapter 6. Now I want you to go to Hosea 8. We're going to look at Galatians 6 and Hosea 8. This is going to be more of a doctrinal sermon. This is going to be more of a doctrinal sermon. Because I believe it will be more eye-opening and helpful if you look at the verses. So we're going to look at the verses together. Alright, the first one, one of the passages is Hosea 8. And then the other one is Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Alright, so Hosea chapter 8 is after the book of Daniel. And don't go to the book of Psalms, Brother Jared, or Job. Alright, so let's look at Galatians chapter 6, and then we'll look at Hosea chapter 8. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, notice that the Bible gives a plain rule. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. Now you notice I said a law. That means it's an unbreakable law. It cannot uh, be broken. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man what soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. Alright, the good news is the latter part of verse 8, but I'm not going to concentrate there. So, in verse 7 and 8, I want you to concentrate that part about, look, if you sow to what your flesh desires. You notice that there? You notice that there? See, it doesn't say plainly sin. It says basically what you live out in the flesh, then you're going to get it back. Now, if you think of it that way, then you're not going to really question God's way of doing things concerning about sin or what is not sin. If you start to understand about how deep the scope of sin is, then you'll understand why God calls it sin. All right? For now, let's just not call it sin here. The point is in this verse 7 and 8, it's pleasing your flesh. All right? Did you hear what I just said? Now, there is absolutely no doubt... And, uh, you know, even a lost person can agree with this. A lost person can agree that the decisions that they want to do in life, and then they uh, do the things that are sin, but, you know, it's not sin in my book. You know, I can watch whatever I watch, listen to what I listen to, and do whatever I want, put anything in my mouth that I want to put anything in my mouth, you know? I mean, uh, sex is sex, you know? I mean, everybody goes through that, you know? Everybody fornicates, everybody divorces, everybody drinks, everybody smokes, and everybody dances, and everybody watches this and that. So, uh, that's the normal thing in life because it pleases our flesh. But it is absolutely impossible and if you're a very honest person and you don't even have to be a Christian if you're a very honest person when you make these decisions you know there's a consequence that follows Amen. there's a consequence that follows I don't know if you ever realize that there's a consequence that follows yep. one thing I learned is that whatever I say and do guess what little kids watch and they follow come on Right. See, you didn't think that cussing is bad before. Normal, everyone cusses, but when you have a child, guess what? You're going to clean up your language. Yeah. Yeah. Or some of you don't. Come on. Come on. And that's why your children are cussing up a storm, and then you're ashamed about that. Imagine having a five-year-old saying an F word. What kind of parent are you? Yeah. So we're now living at that day and age now. Why? Because, see, you, don't, you take it lightly. You don't think it's a big deal. But every sin has a price to pay. Right. You know that? Right. Oh, I thought it was just sex and we did a safe sex. How, did, how can you get pregnant? Sometimes the decisions, you've you got to realize this. I'm not talking about sin here. I'm talking about things that you do in your flesh. Yeah. Unexpected consequences follow. And if you're a very honest person, you know that I'm right about that. Have you ever made a decision that you like? Okay, let's make it simple. Have you ever made a decision that you like to do? All right? And you did it. And then there was a consequence that followed after that? Have you ever done that before in your life? How can you uh, trust this flesh so much? The, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can Amen. know it. 
Following the desires of the heart can be deceptive and lead you down to a path that will kill you and hurt you. Right. I know that to us it's not, uh, doesn't seem dangerous, but it didn't seem dangerous for Eve to take the fruit off a tree. It looked pretty. It's just eating a fruit. That's what sin does. It appears pretty. Sin, it pleases the flesh. And then, basically, what is sin? You know what sin is defined as? It's not uh, all these rules that we lay out. It's drinking, gambling, homosexuality, fornications. No, no, no. Then I'd be legalistic. You know what sin is? The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is easily defined as basically you do something that contradicts and falls short of God's way of doing things. Then you understand why we say this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. That's what sin is defined as. Well, I think that God is too strict and I don't understand that. You don't realize that sin has um, that much of a detrimental effect. Yeah. See, that's your problem. Your problem is I don't see anything wrong with that and you forget that the first thing sin does is it deceives you. Yeah. Right. It deceives right. you. It deceives you and it makes you reap what you sow. Yeah. If you have a stubbornness problem, if you have a prideful attitude, guess what? It's going to pass on. It's going to pass on. If you have an uh, addiction that you're struggling with, guess what? It's going to uh, affect your family. You know, if you have a depression, listen up now, if you have a depression and complaining attitude, guess what? It's going to rub off on other people. Yeah. Sin has a detrimental effect that you don't know. It, you reap what you sow. But it's even worse than that. Hosea chapter 8, if your hand is there, verse 7 says, For they have sown the wind, they shall what? Reap the whirlwind. Yeah. So it's not just that when you sow, you're going to reap to what your flesh desires. Sometimes what you desire in your flesh, you're going to pay the cons equal consequence with that. But guess what? It's even worse than the equal consequence. Well, that ain't fair. Who says sin is fair? Sin is that evil. You don't realize how evil no, sin is. That's not fair. People think that God's unfair. No, that's not God's problem. God, God did everything He could to try to warn you, <clears throat> to rescue you, you about sin, but you're too blind and ignorant and you want to pretend it doesn't exist. God warned you sin is unfair. It will hurt you. Get away from that. Yeah. Amen. I mean, He loved you enough to die for you. Yeah. Amen. He loved you enough to die for you. Yeah. To show you that, look, uh, sin is that much of a heavy price. So you're going to reap the whirlwind. One thing I learned is this in life, and this is undoubtable, and you can doubt me now, but I don't care. I know that every person will come to this point at their life, and I'm pretty sure nearly everyone did, but uh, the decisions that I made in my life, according to my flesh, I never said it was sin, all right? I, uh, the things that I decided in my life, in my flesh, all right, it, have a heady, it had a heavy price to pay, and it was worse than I expected. And I regretted it, and I wish I never committed it. But it's too late. Damage is done. I can't even clean it up. Now it's stained upon my reputation, so to speak. Why? Because that's sin. It's deep in scope. Do you take sin seriously? If you take sin seriously, then you'll be safe from a lot of problems. You know what? The, why we have suffering, depression, hardship, and all this kind of stuff? It's a pretty obvious answer. Sin. Sin. It's because of sin. That's the reason why all these bad things happen in life. If everyone fixed their sinful problem, you know what would happen? We'd be in a paradise right now. Yeah. I know that's hard for you to believe, but it would be. Didn't you know that, here's another point about sin. You can live clean from sin and you can live holy for the Lord, but you'll still suffer. You'll still feel pain. You might say, why is that? That's why we call it the Christian trial, right? Christian suffering. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. But here's something that people don't understand. The only reason why bad things happen to good people is because those bad things happen as a consequence from somebody else's sin. The Bible says, if you look back at Romans 5.12, the Bible says, one man, one man's action, sin passed upon all men. Affects everybody. Look, if a pastor sins, you don't think that's not going to affect the church? Look, anybody could mess up here, but it's one thing when the pastor messes up, and then what? It's going to damage the whole church. If you're in charge of the family, 
Sin yeah. damages the whole family. Yeah. If you're a, if, especially if you're in charge of a country man, and you got one that's a sinner and messes up, guess what? You damage everybody in the country, and now we're suffering for it. Right. That's how powerful sin is. Students, they can work hard and study hard, but if they don't have a good teacher, they can still get a bad grade. Amen. Because of the teacher's faults and misgivings. Right, right. Sin is that powerful, and we don't understand that. We don't understand how wicked, evil, unfair sin is, that it affects other people who are innocent, who have nothing to do with it. And if you don't fix your sin problem, it's going to affect other people that you don't want to affect, and it will hurt them. Guarantee. Guarantee. You know what's really sad? Until you actually experience it, and you experience somebody else getting hurt from your sin, then you finally wake up, then you finally repent. Oh, that you would do it a long time ago. Yeah. It's so important. Sin is so powerful, it will affect other people around you, even if you don't want it. You think Adam wanted his son Seth to be affected by sin? You think he wanted to have a son that would murder his other son Abel? You think Adam was owed to joy that he would have children like that? Why in the world? Why in the world? It's so unfair. Why? Because of Adam's sin. And it affected the, his next generations and his children that he did not expect. And it even affected the whole world. No matter how much he tried to stop and he wanted to uh, revert back the clock and rescue the people that passed from his loins, the children that came out from him. He cannot stop it. Why sin is that detrimental and wicked and unfair? But you make light of it. You don't acknowledge it. You don't realize it. You don't repent of it. You don't try to make reparations. Sin is horrible. Are you ready to get right with the Lord? To get rid of sin? Sin, it also creates an unbearable lust. Look at James 1. Look at James chapter 1. Now in James chapter 1, he tells you that because of our sins, there's something why, there's some reason why sin comes out. And we're hooked and latched onto sin. It's because of an unbearable lust. James chapter 1. And then uh, we'll read verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. See that? And sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Now notice that sin, what it does is that it creates an unbearable desire and lust. Now some of you might think that, oh, you know, the contemporary music is just contemporary music. Uh, but you're going to soon realize that it's stronger than that. A uh, university professor mentioned that uh, rock music is just as strong, if not stronger, than drugs. So that's how powerful music can be. And then uh, some of you know when you start to come to this church and then your pastor, you know, preached against contemporary music and you're like, then well, there's nothing for me to listen to. Now when I hear that, I go, what do you mean? There's plenty of music out there. But you see, the reason why is their whole world revolves around contemporary music. Meaning, their whole world revolves around sin. So without sin, they cannot live. They cannot function throughout the day. They need to turn on that uh, contemporary music. Because it feels iffy and weird during work without contemporary music. Am I getting on to something? Right. Am I getting on to something? It does happen. You know why sin has that unbearable lust? Yeah, that's it. it becomes something that you're used to, that you live and you breathe. And then because of that, it'll affect your life. And then it'll grab you, and then you become hooked to it, and you can't quit it. Didn't you know it's so bad that it can even damage your own health? What do I mean by that? So what I mean is, because you live in sin, what happens is the lust becomes undesirable, that it becomes a part of your life. Now, follow along with me, okay? When sin becomes now a part of your life, because you're used to doing it so many times, 
what happens then is that unconsciously your mind and body naturally does the sin without your consciousness getting involved now. Now it will pop out in your dreams, for example. Now it will pop out uh, where you say the word when you don't even mean to say that word. It will come into a point where you're humming that tune when you don't even realize it when you're humming that tune. And then uh, your thinking has changed without you realizing it because you've been too long into the flesh and the world and it's exposed to sin. And then what happens is then it changes your belief. It changes your spiritual walk. And then you start to think that uh, then what happens is that it changed your unconscious mind and it became your very being that you don't realize how bad it was until you start to clean your sin. Now listen, keep following my train of thought here. So once you start cleaning up that sin, then what happens is, then you realize, man, I'm shaking. Yeah. I didn't know I was that hooked onto it yeah. until now. How can I live and function without this sin? An example is drugs. You get into drugs and then there are, ask the drug addicts. What happens is when you, when you do drugs so much, what happens is then you become addicted to it. When you become addicted to it, it becomes a part of your life, a part of your being, and you can't even breathe without heroin. I've heard of stories that way. I've dealt with those kind of people in the, in the Salvation Army. These people can't breathe without their drug. That's sad. I mean, they can survive. They can live. But see, their mentality has been so used to that worldview of living and breathing and functioning in sin. It became a part of their baby that they've cuddled. And they cannot let that baby go because it hurts so much once you let that baby go. That's good. And you thought that sin was just a game. And you thought that, no, you know, that's not a big deal and stuff like that. And you don't realize your sin. It hurts you. It does everything in life. It does everything in life. It does it with stubbornness. It does it with pride. It does it with jealousy. It yeah. does it with envy. It does it with anger. It does uh, lust. It does uh, fornication, homosexuality, etc. It does everything. That's what sin becomes. It becomes a very part of your being that you feel like this is just me and I can't help it. Unless I do it this way, then I can't function. And that's why some people will even say I'm born this way. It damages health. I'm telling you, if you change the way you're used to your everyday function, how you live and breathe, if you change that, it hurts your health and your mind. And it's hard to change who you are, isn't it? It's hard to change your character and personality because your character and personality was so embedded with sin and used to that for many, many years. And you thought sin was just a game, huh? And you thought that it wasn't that much of a big deal, huh? See, sin is so dreadful. So much problems would be solved if just away from sin. Amen. James chapter 4 verse 2. James chapter 4 verse 2. Now, sin, it, it does, what it also does, is that it also makes you envy, and it makes you desire, and become jealous. That's what sin does. <clears throat> you might say, why? Because you're so used to uh, follow my train of thought again. You're so used to living into that sin. Why? Why did you commit that sin? Because it pleased your flesh. Now recall back from the beginning. <clears throat> sin is basically anything you do that pleases your flesh and it goes against the will of God. Right? Remember that? Remember that? So because you're used to doing things however you want to do things. See that? And because you're so used to doing that and living and acting and talking and thinking that way, what happens then is that once you start to change all that all of a sudden and realize that's sin and that's wrong, it's too hard. I'm telling you what, I had members here, it was a struggle to get rid of contemporary music. I mean, uh, probably 80% uh, of my members would raise their hands and tell you that because they know what it's like. But, you know, no one, uh, but that's how they lived and they were born and raised, see? And became a part of their life and their breathing, uh, breathing and their essence. And then when you get rid of that, it's just too, too difficult. And then why? Because you're, uh, you've done all that to begin with. Why? Why did you do all that to begin with? Think about, why did you do all that to begin with? How did sin become that bad to you? Just all the way at the beginning. I 
wanted to do what I wanted to do. That pleased my flesh, how I felt. But then what happens is sin, it pleases your flesh so much that you get used to it. And the danger now is that now that your flesh is used to it and pleased, it's seeking for something new. And it wants something else. And then what happens is, is that once it doesn't get it, it will long for it. And it will long for it and cry out for it like a new drug addiction. You ever heard about those poor, unfortunate drug addicts once they uh, take heroin or some kind of high drug that it's not as good as the first time? And they try to seek seek something new and then they mix up the drugs and it becomes even more dangerous and that's what sin does with you is that once you're done fornication then what happens is you know I'm going to try some other things in life you know let me try the worldly route the other worldly stuff and then you mess around with sin and then you know you're used to fornicating now let's pass on to a new phase in life I'm grown up they called it you know I'm grown up I'm past the teenage years now let me find something else that I want to do in my flesh you know what that is? That's not just passing through a phase of the flesh. See, that's, a, that's your flesh going through one sinful situation and seeking another sin yeah. situation. Break. Break. That's what it is. Sin will make you jealous of unrealistic things that God did not intend for you to have. Look at the book of James chapter 4 and verse 2. The Bible says, Ye lust and have not... See that? Look at that. They lust. Remember James 1? Uh, lust, it comes out with sin. But see, lust don't stop there. Lust gets used to feeling good. And so what's going to do is that it's, it, that lust has some... It's going to turn into some strong desire where it's jealous. And it wants something that it doesn't have. He lust and have not. He kill and... Look at this. Desire to have and cannot obtain... Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Okay. Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your loss. That's the answer there. The reason why that uh, you didn't get what you want in life, even if you, notice it's amazing, even if you ask it in prayer at verse 2 and 3, the reason why you don't get it is because God knows, no, that's not good for you. I know what that is. You're trying to please sin. I know what really makes you happy. I mean, didn't God says that commit thy works unto the Lord, thy thoughts shall be established, and that he shall give thee the desires of thine heart? Amen. I mean, the Lord created you. He ought to know what your true desire is. How can you trust your flesh on what it desires? Uh, but, but the way it moves, feels, and flows, the heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, it makes you jealous of unrealistic things. It makes you overlook the blessings that you have in your lap right now. You know, it's easy for me to focus on the pain. Now, you might think that I'm a very blessed man. And I thank the Lord. He blessed me with so much. But you didn't hear my pain. And if I told you my pain, then probably some of you wouldn't want my kind of life. And I wouldn't want your life either. <laughs> One thing I learned is this. One thing I learned is you're not going to be content whichever life you get into. There's always going to be something you're not going to be pleased with. Something that the flesh will long to have. Everything is missing somewhere in life. So you know what I've learned to do? Just be happy with what I have. And then when I'm happy with what the Lord has given to me. I mean, I got a wonderful church. I mean, what better church can I ask for? Yeah. I mean, the Lord blessed my ministry. How can I deny the fruits? I mean, the Lord blessed me with a wonderful family, nice home, and then good f people who are close in my life, and what more can I complain? Yeah. And then if I told you my pain, the list would go on and on and on. And then guess what? If I tell you everything of my pain... And what happens is that pain fills up list after list after list and the blessing seems smaller and practically non-existent. And then I believe that my life is so unfair and unjust. But once you start counting your blessings, see that? Instead, then what happens is that you rejoice in the Lord. And you realize that you've got it made that other people don't have. You know what helps me not to be... Uh, 
you know what helps me not to be jealous and not let sin take advantage of me? You know, I've lived the, look, I've lived the holy Christian life in Berkeley where I try to abstain from the world, the worldly activities at Berkeley. I've tried to stay away from sin. I've tried to live, um, you know, I tried to live holy and uh, clean for the Lord. But guess what? I'm flesh. I ain't the holy pastor that you think. There were sins, there were things in the world and fleshly opportunities I wanted to have. Temptation was real and was there. What made you not fall into that? What made you not jealous of that, Pastor? It's because that when I start to count my blessings and realize that I had stuff that they didn't have. I kept looking at what I didn't have and they have when I should have switched around and said, I got something that they don't have. I got a home in heaven. I got a mansion. My salvation is secure. I'm not going to burn in hell forever. So what good is it that I had all the unbelieving world had and then you burn for all eternity? What good is all that? I mean, I had the Lord's blessing. He gave me His promise that in my pain, even in my pain, yeah. He would work it for good. Romans 8, 28. He would give me grace to go through it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Yeah. That, his, that He will provide all my needs. That He is in control and I'm not in control. So even if my plans fall apart, you know what the problem is? I organize and plan out everything and then feel like that this is what's going to make things successful or happy and what happens is the Lord just shows me right there, see you at your best in your flesh. It's it's all nothing. It comes to ruin. And then the Lord's, why? Because He's trying to teach me that you give up now and you're going to have faith in me. I say, God, I do. And then He starts working. Amen. And then when He starts working and moving in my heart, then He always goes beyond my expectations. He always goes beyond my thinking. Why? Because He wants to teach me that my thoughts and how I organize in the flesh should not be relied upon more than Him. Awesome. And when I do that, when I do that in my pain and in my suffering and the time when the world hasn't made and I don't, it keeps me going and it makes me even more blessed and more thankful, more appreciative what the Lord has done for me. Amen. That's what sin does. It drives into an unrealistic thing. You know what Eve saw? See, she, she had all the fruit in the garden. It was just that one fruit. Wow. Just that one fruit that she wanted. And she had all the fruit in the garden. But there's just that one fruit. And the devil made it so pretty. And sin so alluring. And you know what? Made her long it. And when she ate it, and Adam ate it, sin had a detrimental cost. It's not and it, it's not worth it. It affected, it affected the next generations and all of history, human time. Why? Because sin is unfair. It always looks pretty in front of you. It's not going to make itself ugly and make God convincing and real and His Word real. Sin is going to work in a deceptive manner that meets all the fleshy parts that you have and then try to say, Hey, don't I look good? Take a bite. It makes you jealous of sin and makes you long things for what you want rather than what God has given to you. If... Uh, you look at Acts chapter 17. Look at Acts chapter 17. We're going to look at that passage. We're going to look at Acts chapter 17. Another issue concerning about sin is that it does something where it makes you completely ignorant. It makes you ignorant. You know what the thing about people is? Is that um, it's so amazing concerning about people is that, and this includes your pastor too, okay? Because I really get this until the Lord shows me deeper. When you think you're right with the Lord because you read your Bible, you pray, and you thought you were humble. You heard what I said? You thought you were humble. All right. Why? Because you showed more love than the brethren. You're the one that pulled extra hours in church and they didn't. Okay? And it's the tendency comes in where you easily ignore your own weaknesses and your own errors. And you know what that is, plainly? Sin. You know how guilty I am of that? It's so easy as a pastor to think that way. So easy. Very easy. You know why? Because I'm a pastor. You're not. So me, you know. But then, you know what? The Lord, He showed me more and more and more when I thought I was humble enough, when I was loving enough, and I did the right thing enough, the Lord showed me, here are some things you didn't know before. And then I realized, oh God, I... I'm so sorry, I didn't know it had that much of an impact. And the Lord said, it's okay, now you know, what are you going to do about it? And you know what the problem with many people is? The problem with many people is they justify. 
and they say, well, you know, I didn't know before, so you can't blame me, and I'm going to keep doing it, then the Lord's going to hold you accountable. Sometimes you don't realize this. Sin comes out in ignorance. That's my next pointer. That's how unfair it is. What? You mean I don't have to deliberately make a decision? That's right. Sin works through ignorance. You think little children know that when their parents cuss that they're not supposed to cuss? They copycat you. That's how, just how they're born. Sin comes out from ignorance. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. Now you realize how serious sin is, right? Sin is far serious than you think that some of you are sinning right now without you realizing it. You know that? Some of you are living and acting and doing things in a way where you don't even realize that you're sinning. Acts 17 verse 30 says, And the times of this what? Ignorance. God winked at. What, what are they ignoring? The next part. But now commandeth all men everywhere to what? Repent. See that? It's because of their, the way they lived and sin. And God kept ignoring. And God, He winked at their what? Ignorance. Ignorance. And then God's like, no, it's about time. Now you realize, repent! But that's the thing about people is that once they're uh, given the word repent, oh, freeze them. They go, what did I do wrong? I don't see what's wrong with my sin. You ever seen those uh, crazy party, uh, parties that they have? Beach summer parties and then people living out uh, their sexual lifestyle that's uh, not the way, that's the biblical way. And then once you get a person that says, repent, first, what is the first reaction of people? Oh, you're right, but I don't. Uh, you're right, but I don't care. No, a good percentage of them says Shh, you don't know what you're talking about. What am I doing wrong? Yeah. You know why? Sin is that po It is that poisonous. It makes people where they are ignorant. They don't realize. They don't know they're doing what's wrong. Well, what, at what point then would God hold you accountable? What, at what point what God makes you accountable is when you know it's wrong. So then he's going to point out, look, you can't keep saying that way, doing that way, living that way, and acting that way anymore because it's it hurts and it's wrong. And then when you start to see those things, what's the problem? The problem is 90% of people reject it. They want to live out in their own ignorance because ignorance is bliss. And that's why they'll keep committing the sin. For example, people didn't... I mean, when you first came to our church, you didn't know that uh, different modern Bible versions were wrong. You just thought that, you know, I just want to read the Bible. I just want to read the Word of God. And then when you realized all of a sudden, repent! That's a sin. What you're having is a different Bible version that actually promotes wrong doctrine. Uh, if any of you have questions about that, you can ask me after church. And then some of it is just plainly blasphemous, giving titles of Satan to Jesus, believe it or not. So uh, the thing is, is that uh, Jesus' title is given to Satan, actually. Uh, well, it works the other way around. But anyways, the point is, is that in these bi uh, modern Bible versions, is that they promote really dark stuff. And then when you realize that, oh, repent, it's wrong, the natural reaction... Of 90% of people is rejection. But also, 100% of the people didn't know before. You know why? It's not like they want to deliberately blaspheme Jesus and get a different Bible version. Why? Because that's how sin works. It works through ignorance. Or you don't know. Well then, uh, that's scary, Pastor. Yeah, you're right. That's how scary sin is. You don't realize the heavy price of sin. So once you know sin, if, you, if you're pointing out what the sin is, if I were you, I'd repent and get that under the blood. Amen. Otherwise, it's going to carry on and it'll affect you more deeply and it'll affect everyone around you more deeply. It has such a heavy price to pay. Amen. If you look at the Psalms chapter 59, let's look at Psalms chapter 59. and We'll look at verse 12. Psalms chapter 59, verse 12. Sin, what it does is that uh, it, makes you pride, it makes you proud. The most apparent example is Satan. Most powerful being. So you would think that if there's a person who is more powerful than you, who has the ability, who has the ability to please God more than you, that's the devil, Lucifer, before he fell. He was second in charge. He had all the power. And then uh, what happened? 
what happened was pride got into him. And then what happens is when you sin, pride follows along and it becomes a horrible thing where pride dominates your life and the number one thing that will get you not to repent is your pride. And I believe everybody experienced that, including myself. I strongly believe that. The Bible says, I'll explain a little bit more why. The Bible says, Psalm 59 verse 12, For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken. But the sin that they committed out of their mouths were what? It was from where? A deeper thing. Pride. Pride. And for cursing and lying which they speak. Those are other sins mentioned. You know what sin does? It makes you stubborn. And it makes you think that there's nothing wrong because of ignorance, but it turns into a very powerful dark thing that you're justifying sin now. You're justifying... Uh, everyone has a... Uh, let me give you, uh, give you an eye-opening statement. You ready for this? Everyone has a reason to skip their Bible reading and prayer and not go to church that day. Who does not have an excuse? If there's one thing that, uh, it doesn't matter how dumb you think your children are, all right? If there's one thing children are good at is that they can be lawyers. You might say, well, how so? Why are they lawyers? Because they know what kind of excuses to give to their parents. Now look, every, so let's be honest. Everyone, I don't care what age or who you are, everyone has that problem. So how, so that's the dangerous thing about sin, is that sin comes out at a way where you make excuses for your actions. It becomes even more dangerous when you justify it, and it becomes way worse, and disrespectful, and it becomes blasphemous when pastors start doing that, with the way they pastor their churches. That's why I kick them harder than any other person, believe it or not. Why? They should know better. They know too much from the Word of God. But they manipulate and use the Word of God to justify their wrongdoings. You see why I kick pastors very hard? That, that is the most disrespectful thing you can ever do. And if you're not careful, you're going to do that. That's what sin does because it makes you... Uh, remember, sin... It makes you ignorant, so you don't see what you're wrong, that you're going to convince yourself that what you did was right, because you're only going to concentrate on your good pointers, your innocent points. You're not going to focus on your weaknesses instead. And by doing that, what happens is you will always forever justify the way you do things in your sin. That's why it must be repented of. You don't realize how serious it is that it can damage your life incredibly deeper than any other thing. Yet, now, you ever heard a sermon like this before? Shouldn't it have been told at the very beginning? Why don't preachers preach against sin? Because it hurt and damaged too many lives. How dare churches don't bring about sin and don't say Jesus never judged people and, and you know, never preached against sin and etc, etc. How dare you? You want people then to live ignorant lives into their sin and let sin damage them and then when they head off to college, no wonder they lose their faith after that. Why? Because they heard too much good stuff in your church that's nothing but filled with garbage. All positive. All making feel good. And you deceive people thinking that's how life should be. No, you got to realize life is unfair. Life is dark. Life is evil. And the only way you can attain that happiness is to battle sin. Is to fight and not give up and overcome it. And to try to clear out sin from your life, from other people's life. And the greater and greater the environment that kicks out sin, the greater and greater you can be in happiness and the joy of the Lord. Happiness is not just given to you. How, how can you think that in a sin offensed world where suffering has been irrefutable for the past 6,000 years of human history? You know what's even worse is that uh, sin, it just makes you so addicted that despite of how much tragedy comes out, you're still hooked. 
in us. How grievous sin is. Sin hurts so much. How can you not see and repent the sin even when bad things are happening? You know, I've seen people, I've seen people, and I, I would tell people who I greatly love in my family, and I would tell them, can't you see? I told you this years ago! And that, what did you expect when you keep going down this worldly route, this sinful fleshly route? I, these things would happen. So why don't you just get out of there? Just come back. Just come to church and then... You know what's so sad? These people, they'll cry and whine to you about their suffering and their pain and their problem because of the sin. And then when you tell them about that, they justify it. Because of that previous point, their pride, and they find reasons, and then try to go around it. Yeah. And then when, by doing that, then they stay there. And when you're trying to help them out of the tragedy, they just want to stay in the tragedy. Concentrate and focus on the tragedy. Not overcome it! Not annihilate it! Sin is that detrimental. I hate sin so much. If there's one thing your pastor is not going to compromise, I ain't going to compromise on sin. I'm going to preach against sin till the day I die. You know why? That damage too many people. And even people in my family that I greatly love. I hate sin so much. It's so... Just look at those poor people out on the streets who are onto drugs. Maybe you have family members like that, huh? And then you, you did everything in the world. You begged for mercy. You begged them to open their eyes. You begged them to get out of sin. You begged them to just get out of that sin. And then they just kept justifying. They just kept making excuses. And they just kept sticking on to their sin. And then no matter, no matter how sad and miserable and stinky and homeless and how much poverty they face in their life, they just, let, they just keep sinning. No matter how tragic and sad their life is, they want to stay there because of their sin. That is the most unfathomable thing I'll never understand about sin, is how can sin be, how can we love sin that much? If sin betrayed you, treated you abusively, if sin spat at your face, if sin uh, did all kinds of incredible hurtful things against you, it's so amazing that we as stupid human sinful flesh would just stick to it and hold on to that. Jesus bled and died for you. On the world. He, he could care less about his life. He threw down his life for you. And it's amazing. We don't, we're not willing to trust in his hands. We're willing to trust how this wicked enemy of ours feels. Amazing. Amazing. You know, people, they, uh, they shout when one of the uh, things in heaven that you're going to see is Satan cast into the lake of fire. Oh, that makes me shout. But you know, what? you know what the thing that I shout more than that? Is that my rotten flesh and sin is gone and whatever I do, it will never hurt the Lord again. Amen. It will never hurt my life again. It will never hurt others around me again. So I, would, uh, I want to close this message with uh, giving you hope, obviously. And uh, let me wrap it up right here. In order to overcome the, the sin, I, uh, what you need to do is you need to pray. When's the last time you prayed? You prayed to the Lord, Lord, show me what's going wrong here and what needs to be fixed. And that follows with humility. The next thing is that the Lord's going to show you the answer. He will probably show you the answer through your conscience or through someone else or through a detrimental experience that will open your eyes. Or maybe in your Bible reading and prayer. I don't know. But he's, He will show you. He will show you. So that's why humility is so important. You know, the, you know what's the opposite of humility? Pride. To say that, no, I'm right with God and, you know, because I read the Bible, I'm a Christian, I don't, I, I've done everything to the best intention of my heart, so how could that be wrong? Well, just look at Cain, you know? Just look at everybody else who's living in good works for salvation, better than you, with good hearts and intentions. And guess what? They're still wrong. And they're still going to die and burn in hell. Why? Because they're relying on the works of their flesh rather than the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The point is, is that Scripture triumphs. When God shows you what's truth, it will triumph above everything that you believe in, your own worldview. 
And then when he shows it to you, you have to have the humility to say, okay, I admit this is a weakness of mine, and then I accept it. I'm wrong, Lord. By doing that, then what happens is, is then you receive whatever counsel that the Lord gives to you through His Word, or through others, or through the Holy Spirit guiding through your heart. And the saddest way that you're going to learn the counsel is through experience, actually. That's the number one counselor, in my opinion, is experience. Because once you finally go through the situation and all your five senses of the flesh feel and see and taste and uh, look at all those things, then it finally realizes, okay, then uh, life lesson I learned and I'm not going to do that again. Which is the tendency why you say that to your children, right? Why do parents do that? Because there's something they went through. They don't want their children to go through. I've learned that. All right, so it's pretty easy to do that. So, but you don't want experience to be your counselor, because you don't want to experience the pain and the hurt and the damage that you can't recover. It's best that uh, you take whatever counsel the Lord has given into your life and then you act upon it. It's very important that uh, when you hear, like here's an example, you hear a preaching and the preaching convicted your heart and you know what your counsel is. And then what you're going to do is you come down on the altar, you get right with God and say, Lord, okay, I've learned which principles I should do to conquer sin. I'm going to act them now. And don't start it, don't start it like, I will act now. No, you set up a time frame. What you should do is set up a time. As soon as I get home, I'm going to do it that time. Now. You need to commit. You need to act. But then it comes to the next point. A lot of you know how bad sin is and you get easily depressed and discouraged. And some of you don't come back to church anymore because you just feel rotten and guilty and ashamed. You know what you need to do? Look, if you repent and you pleaded the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, just get back over here. Amen. Amen. You know, it's so sad. So many people don't come to church anymore because of guilt. Because of shame. Look, man, uh, we're all born again brothers and sisters in Christ. All right? Now, look, if you're half-hearted, we don't want you back and then you cause burdens and problems. We've had some of those people before. But we've had way more people than some. We've had way more people who repented, pled the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they just want to repair their lives. And then I wish that they would come to church, but they don't. It's really sad. I would, look, uh, do you know how many times this pastor has sinned? If I would tell you all the stories in my life, then you would be shocked. But I would be shocked with yours too. All you see is happy people in here trying to focus on spiritual things. But you don't know the times we fell into our flesh. And what kind of a hassle we can be to you because of our flesh. Look, just a thousand times try again. Did not God say that if you sin seven times a day and say, I repent, you're forgiven. Look, God's going to repair, restore. Just say... Lord, I repent, and don't say it half-heartedly, mean it, plead the blood. The flesh might cry out, say, oh, you're going to do it again, though. Did you really mean it? And you know you're going to fall tomorrow. Just ignore that and claim His promise. Believe in His promise. Get to church. And then if this is your thousandth time failing, guess what? Uh, you're in good company right here. Amen, brother. Alright, so we'll be here for you. Okay? So just try new again. You know, people, they easily get discouraged after one fall and then they think it's the end of the world. If you live like that, you're never going to overcome sin. Don't give up. Don't give up. You need to, you, you know what? The Bible says a just man, just man, yeah. fall it seven times, yeah. but rises up again. Good boy, amen. And God puts that to what? Seven times even in a day and say, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Amen. And that's why I want to close with is you need faith is that you need to believe. You've heard everything, but it, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You heard the Word of God, but it's not going to come anything until you have put your faith on it. What kept me in my life was an undying faith, belief that, Lord, that this is what your Word said, and I believe in your promise. And no matter how deceptive sin was against my five sense, senses of the flesh, you know, I believed in His Word. And when I believed in His Word and hung on to it, the Lord pulled me through. Because think about it. You know one thing I've learned? At John chapter 6, when Jesus said something that didn't please people and they all ran away, 
Jesus said to his remaining twelve, Are you going to go away too? And Peter, what did he say? Where can we go? You're the only one who has the words of eternal life. Now, the simple challenge, and I will be proven 100% right, is just uh, forsake the Lord Jesus then. Just don't go by His way. And I guarantee 100% is that uh, you will find nothing out there. That's what kept me in the faith. You know what kept me in the faith? As I studied everything out there, I didn't want to experience it, but I looked at other people who went out there. And then I studied and I predicted in my mind, let's say if I did this and lived out like that and stuff like that. And then I recall the past times God taught me lessons of what I did in my flesh. By seeing all that, I realized that, look, there, there's nowhere to go except Jesus. If Without Jesus, how can you live and function in life in a world filled with sin? Every head bow and every eye shut. Amen. I'm going to leave the altar call open if you want to give some time to uh, repent and pray to the Lord and... Sin is so potent, uh, sin is so strong, sin is so deadly, sin is so wicked and evil and unfair. And that's something that uh, you need to realize that it's not a game. It's not a game. You know, uh, just in, uh, you know, your pastor, he's, you know, when I was preaching this message, I was recalling some things in, uh, my generations and within my families and I've just hurt so much. I've lived 20 years living for the Lord and some of them still don't understand that and guess what? They're still living miserable lives. Sad. Sad. Because they have so much pride and ignorance. Sure, I may have been the one on the defeating end in my family's eyes when I gave up everything to serve the Lord. But uh, they later found out that, look, man, uh, your life is the best way. I don't know why I didn't live that way. It's not until experience comes in that they learn the hard way. But it's too late. They lost too much. Don't lose what you have. Do not lose what you have. Sin already took away too much from you, right? You lost already too much. But guess what? You didn't lose all. You didn't lose some. Don't lose more. Sin is such a heavy price to pay. Oh, how much I hate sin. And it's not because of uh, people committing sin and I have anger against them. It's more so myself. On how weak my flesh is. And how great sin is that I regret too many times how many times I've come to the Lord complaining and becoming bitter at Him. Sure, your pastor does. Yeah, I regret too many times. But uh, I know this, I'm flesh and it's still going to happen. That's one thing I learned. I'm capable of doing anything. That's one thing I learned. If you acknowledge that about your flesh, the Lord can do so much more with you. If, you're capa if you acknowledge, I'm capable of being the worst, and I want to acknowledge and see those things. And then the Lord will give you strength. Don't be depressed and discouraged if you did it, if you fall back again and again and again and again and again. If your reason for giving up is because you fell that one time or two times, three times, even the hundredth time, you will never live for Him. You will never live a happy life. When you fall, you get back up and the Lord will heal. How many times uh, are we capable of... Uh, failing the health of our body and we might break it. There's a point in our body we could break somewhere and hurt and damage. Even the hundredth time. But you know what? It's a matter of just constantly trying and protecting our health that we can keep improving. And even if we fall back again, we'll still get become better. If that's a common sense just in life, why not our spiritual health and spiritual well-being? God, my Father, I went over the time. Um, I pray that today's preaching has been sober and has convicted and changed people. Sin is such a deadly thing, Father. I, I hate it so much. And I will keep preaching against sin without compromise, even if people will hate me for it, even if people will feel uncomfortable about it, even if people will think that I'm too wholly illegalistic. No, Lord, uh, sin is such a heavy price. 
Mankind is incredibly ignorant from the past 6,000 years of human history, and they still won't learn. So I will keep preaching what you've called me to preach. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.